there are louder and louder voices in our culture today that are protesting or denying altogether the biblical foundation upon which the nation is built. Many are rewriting history, and we see it in the textbooks, schools. Others uh, falsely accuse Christians of wanting to turn America into a theocracy. Theo, Greek word for God, and therefore it means the rule of God. I don't know of a single thoughtful Christian who ever declared that we want a theocracy. Theocracy is only going to be in heaven. But the problem is that when a lie is repeated often, after a while people will believe it as the truth. Lenin, the founder of the modern communist movement who knows all about lying, said that uh, a lie told often enough becomes the truth. And throughout history, there has been differing forms of government through the years. Monarchy, which is a form of government which all the power are concentrated in the hand of one individual, the monarch. Uh, there is the oligarchy, which is the concentration of power in the hands of the elite few. The word oligoi means few. Democracy is the government of the demos or the peop of people. Theocracy is the rule of God as king. And only Israel, who has experienced true theocracy, and not for a very long time, believe me, from the time they came out of the slavery of Egypt to the time of the prophet Judge Samuel, they lived under the theocracy where leaders were implementing and following the law of Moses. But then they got tired of having an invisible king that they cannot feel and touch and talk to. So they went to Samuel and said, give us a king. Give us an earthly king, just like the rest of the nation. And Samuel goes out and cries to God, and God says, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Give them a king. And Saul became the first king of Israel. And what a scourge he was. <laughs> Hear me right, please. What distinguishes between Christians, and I'm talking about true, genuine Christians, and non-Christians, is that the Christians believe that God rules and reigns over their lives. And our call in life as true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, as true Christians, our, the call of God upon our life is to show the world, show the people how wonderful that rule of God in our lives is. I want you to turn with me, please, to Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and His arm with strength. The world is firmly established that cannot be moved. Your throne was established long ago. You are from eternity. The seas have lifted up. O oh Lord, the seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breaks of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your statues stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days, O oh Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, will you open our spiritual eyes that we may see the wonderful truth from your word. For the glory is yours forever and ever. Amen. Psalm 93 declares the kingship of Yahweh. Psalm 93 tells us that God is exalted in three ways. First, the triumph of God's rule, verses 1 and 2. Secondly, the turmoil of those who oppose God's rule, verses 3 and 4. And verse 5, thirdly, the truth about God's rule. First, there is the triumph of God's rule. Look at verse 1. The Lord reigns. Whether we like it or not, He reigns. Whether the atheists like it or not, He reigns. Whether the government likes it or not, He reigns. He is clothed or robed, as your translation said, with majesty. The Lord is clothed or robed with strength. 
You see, most people still want to think today of the weak and meek Jesus, the helpless Jesus. They want to think of the baby Jesus as if he was a baby forever. They want to think of a milk toast Jesus, a helpless Jesus. And yet the Bible said that we know him after the flesh no more. What does that mean? It means that that very Jesus who had nowhere to lay his head during his earthly life it now reigns in splendor and in majesty over the rim of the universe. That the very Jesus who died on the cross to redeem everyone who would believe in him, now at the seat of power and at the seat of splendor over the entire universe, the very Jesus, he was mocked and bled to death and died for us, is now sitting on the throne of the entire universe. That that same Jesus who was dragged around from court to palace like a common criminal by evil men now possesses all authority, all power, all grandeur, all splendor over the whole universe, whether they can see it or not. So much so that the disciple whom the Lord Jesus loves, John, when he was privileged, and he tells us in the book of Revelation to see the majesty and the splendor of the resurrected, glorified Jesus, he fell on his face and he couldn't even look up. And when Isaiah saw the Lord's majesty and splendor in Isaiah chapter 6, he became speechless, and all he could say is, Woe to me, woe to me, woe to me. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. I often wonder if God just revealed a tiny glimpse of His splendor. I tell you, we be ashes. We could never, ever survive seeing a tiny glimpse of His splendor. Our King of kings, He is robed in majesty and splendor, and no one can dislodge that from Him. Uh, for His power is from everlasting to everlasting. His authority is from age to age. His splendor is from all eternity. His strength is immutable. His throne is established and cannot be moved. And the world cannot be changed without His saying so. You know, I genuinely, deeply, in my heart, feel pain and sorrow for anyone who rejects the authority of Jesus Christ over their life. I really do. For in the day of judgment, those very people who have rejected Him will stand in terror and fear, while those of us who loved Him will reign and rule with Him. Those of us who love His authority over us, those of us who love His commandments, those of us who love His Word, those of us who love His decrees, they will rejoice with great joy. Beloved, listen to me. No human nature is immutable. No human being is permanent. No human being is unchangeable. Only Jesus, King Jesus, is immutable and permanent and unchanging. In fact, Jude, in his epistle, described those who are full of themselves, those who think that they are gods, all those Hollywood celebrities, those who worship themselves, their own ideas, their own opinions, their own feelings, their own, what they think is right. He describes them as clouds without rain, blown along with the wind, as autumn trees without fruit uprooted, as wild waves of the sea foaming with shame, as wandering stars for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Ah, oh, but God is unchangeable. The splendor of His majesty is unshakable. The authority of His throne is forever. His reign and His rule is immutable. He is yesterday, today, and forever. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the one before whom all angels prostrate, crying out, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, for He was and is and is to come. People may ignore him. There are some cute preachers around who try to bring him down to their level and treat him like the bellhop. There are false teachers who try to cut him down to size 
But the Word of God said, Your throne was established long ago. You are from eternity. The triumph of God's rule. Secondly, the turmoil of those who oppose Him or those who even try to ignore Him. I want you to look closely at verses 3 and 4 because they're not what you may think they mean. And I'm going to back up what I'm going to tell you first by Scripture. In Isaiah chapter 17 and in Jeremiah chapter 6, again in Jeremiah chapter 50, they all give us an image in the Old Testament of the waves of the sea and what the waves are. They tell us that those who rebel against God's rule are like the raging of the waves of the sea. They sound like roaring sea. And the psalmist is saying the same thing here. Look at verses 3 and 4 again. He gives us a picture of those who reject the authority of God's Word, who reject the rule of God over their lives as the sea with all of its mighty mass of waters, uh, with constant unrest of its wave, churning, churning, churning. You see them on television. They're angry. They might smile with their teeth. But, but they are angry on the inside. Uh, they ceaseless, the uh, pounding against the rock, constantly pounding, pounding, they continue as foaming against the firmament. Uh, those who are at enmity with the rule of God, those who have rejected the authority of Jesus Christ in their lives, those who refuse the supremacy of the King of kings, they are like the roaring of the ocean whose power is mere noise and temporary. Isaiah 17, 12 says, all oh, the raging of many nations, they rage like the raging sea. All oh, the uproar of the peoples, they roar like the roaring of great waters. See, the way God sees them, <laughs> it's just noise. They noise. He longs for them to repent and live under His authority, but they just noise. It's like an ant trying to kill an elephant. Raging with anger against God. But God says they will die and disappear. They will become relics of history. Ah, oh, but our Lord is forever. Those who belong to Him will live with Him forever. Atheists and agnostics and those into dead religions can look at their turmoil and they would say, where is God? Why doesn't He do something about this evil? Hmm. It's an interesting phenomenon, is it not? It's almost fashionable today to blame somebody else for our troubles. Blame somebody else. Never take responsibility. That's an indictment on our culture today. How can a loving God not do something about this turmoil in the world? Well, God did something. He came from heaven. He died on a cross, and He rose from the dead, and He invited everyone to come under His rule, and He said only His rule over people's hearts can bring peace. Yeah, just think with me for a moment. You got a piece of machinery, and it's broken. You already have thrown out the designer's manual, and then you complain. The triumph of God's rule, the turmoil of God's enemies. Thirdly, the truth of God's rule. Look at verse 5. Your statues stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days, O Lord. There's never been a time from the little history that I know, where we face such a clear choice as we do today. The rule of God or the rule of Satan. The reign of the Word of God or the reign of terror of man. The authority of heaven or the power of hell. The choice is clear. 
Psalm 119, 2 says, Blessed are they who keep his statue and seek him with all their hearts. Beloved, we have been given a stewardship. You see, I lived under dictatorships. I lived under socialism. I didn't have a choice, but God placed a choice in your hands and in mine. It is a privilege that I would literally plead with you that you wake up and realize it. And the psalmist is saying, those who confess God must also obey Him. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commandments. You can't say you love Jesus and you live your life in utter disobedience to His Word. That the two just can't go together. But what does all that mean? It means these folks, of course, only paying lip service to the term Christian. Because the Bible is very clear. No one can truly be a Christian person without submitting to the authority of Christ as Savior, but also as Lord. Do we obey Him perfectly? Do I obey Him perfectly? Of course not. I fail more than I can count. but it's a desire to live under His Lordship in obedience that God honors. And obedience doesn't come naturally. I just chuckle when people say, well, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I got news for you. I can follow Jesus Christ on my own strength. It is His power that He gives us to help us live in obedience. And if you've never claimed that, you can today. When Saul of Tarsus had an encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus before he became the Apostle Paul, he asked one question. What would you have me do, Lord? Lord. And the psalmist is saying that everything associated with God must be holy. And that is why here holiness means to us is unconditional surrender in obedience to the Lord and His Word. And that is why I issue an invitation. Every time I preach, I do not leave you without giving you an opportunity to make a choice. Are you going to surrender to Jesus Christ or are you going to continue living your life your way? And if you're tired of living your life your way and if you're tired of failing then come to Him who can give you victory. If you'd like to learn how to know God in a personal way, ask for the booklet, Finding the Joy You've Always Wanted. It will tell you of God's love for you and explain how to experience His forgiveness. a personal relationship with God and you're interested in walking closer with Him, the booklet Seven Steps in Your Faith Adventure will help guide you into a deeper fellowship with your Heavenly Father. Ask for your free booklet.